he walked up to me and said, yo, my homeboy didn't want to know if you talk about him in that record. Mm. I said, what record? Who's your homeboy? He mm. said, Pac. Yeah. So Pac walked up. I said, I said, Pac, come here. Two people would be saying, how can they support the channel? Chizzo, buy Chizzo. I've got tops, I've got hoodies. I've got the Jungle Mall Z tees, like the Pain and Full Star tees. You lot could support, buy some of the merch. I'll be able to churn out more content. This one, I'm just waiting by myself for the, for the moment and I'll bring out more colors. Please support. Where do you get all that oil from? I ain't got a clue. <laughs> but our energy prices have just gone sky roof. It's, up. it's crazy. I don't know how we're going to survive over here now. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be in my house with candles on. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> I'm going to be candles. I ain't switching on. No lights, no TV, nothing, boy. So I'm, you preserve it as cheaper? Or is it just the set price? No, you have like a standing charge, which is if you don't use it, then you have a charge per kilowatt. Per ki That's how yeah. it works in this, this country. So with gas and electric, you've got like a kilowatt charge. And if you don't use it, there's still a standing charge, even if you don't Regardless, use it. Regardless, so even if you don't get, use it. You're gonna, they're going to charge you something even yeah, if you don't like use it. it's like that in the States. But the more you use, the more it costs. Of course, yeah. Same here as well. But now they're, they're hiking up the prices ridiculously. So at the moment, mm. it's it's basically by this time next year, it should be like, what, four or five times higher? Yeah, I think it's going to be. Yeah. So they're saying that by the time we hit well, next $4, year. $4,000 for the light bill? Yeah, so by <laughs> January 23, <laughs> yeah. apparently it's going to be costing us around a £1,000 a month for our gas and electric. And by April. A thousand pounds, but he said he should go twelve hundred right now. No, no, no. Twelve. No, we're saying that twelve hundred is normal rent, but we're saying what's going to happen is the gas, gas and electric, electric is going to be match. It's going to match the rent. Oh, this is uh, your light bill twelve hundred. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just the light bill a month twelve hundred. So it's going to be more. Yep. It's five dollars a gallon in New York. Okay. The gas. New York, is that where you're from originally, New York, and you still live in New York now? Okay, what part of New York are you originally? Long Island. Long Jeez, Island. That's off. Oh, we cut this. No problem. You know what's crazy? Yeah. When we were in uh, uh, LA, mm -hmm. they were saying the spike on petrol, so per gallon, it was like, I think it was seven or eight dollars, and everyone's complaining. Yeah. And in Atlanta, it was like nearly half. Yeah. And I was just like, how's it all in one country and everything is higher in one state compared to the other. Whereas mm. over here, we're equivalent of what LA was, mm. or maybe even slightly higher. We're more, if you calculate it to gallon, at the time we were close to like $9 per gallon. Okay. Taxes are high in certain places. Yeah. So now the tax is going up, it's gonna be higher where it's normally higher. Okay. So, that, mm, on. so where you LA based- Hills is where the most richest, richest people, people are, are in New York City is the most expensive place. So those two places, the taxes are astronomical. New York is scary. You might have a a, a house this size, mm -hmm. and you're looking at probably smaller like than this. smaller than this. Fifteen hundred a month. A, room. a month. The kitchen yeah. is yeah. in the living room. Huh? <laughs> what do you mean the kitchen's in the living room? That's how big <laughs> it is. And that'd be like fifteen hundred dollars a month. Oh, yeah. The studio. Yeah. Okay. So what was it like living in New York? I know you was raised in New York, but how have you, just talk through the journey. So uh, apparently there's someone called MC Do Damage. Who is that? That's me at a younger age, about 16. And where did that name come from? I was in a crew called Do Damage and Impact. Mm -hmm. Me and my cousin LBM was doing 25, uh, eight and a third to 25 to life. Damn. Is he out now or? Nah, he got about, Seven more years, eight more years, probably. And he's been gone since what year? I can't remember, but he's gone a wow. long time. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. He probably been like 10 years, some shit, if that. He might got 10 more. I just black out or shit like that. Yeah. I don't really study it. I just know how much time he got. Mm -hmm. So when you say you black out, have you, would you say that you've just decided to kind of take, have you decided to sort of numb and sort of erase all of those kind of traumas from your head? Selective memory mm. and is that how you basically coped through life in general basically because mm, when you said that you you black it out it's almost as if that you we have what they call neural pathways and it's almost like as if you've closed those channels to those memories, those memories and those triggers so you're not triggered by yeah by like post-traumatic stress disorder you know, my mind just forgets things that is shitting from bad memories mm. Is that, is that the coping mechanism that you've used to navigate through 
through life in general is it that you compartmentalize certain things where this doesn't trigger me so i remember that but this triggers me so i'm just going to keep that in the back of my well i don't forget nothing but i just it just happens like that. Like, I don't know the date my mother passed away or the date my father passed away. I just know my father passed away when I was in eighth grade and my mm. mother passed away when I was 19 years old. That's very young. That's very young. What age did you start rapping? 12 years old. I started writing my own rhymes. But I knew all the songs on the radio when I was like 10 years old. Okay. So when was the first time you decided to, like, do your first record at what age? Well, it was a progression. It kind of like came to me. I um, have an uncle named the original B-Boy T-Roy. Okay. And he's the youngest of my grandmother's boys in the family. My father's the oldest. So he's always dress hip hop, freestyle, rap, uh, go to the parties. He had his own rhymes. He was an MC. He still is an MC. Okay. So I just asked him one time how they do that. And then he told me a particular rhyme that he knew to write it down. And my assignment was to remember it. So I wrote it down and I studied it, studied it, and I put it on my brain. And then I remembered it. And then I started going from there. I was listening to the radio all the time. And I knew all the records. And then I just started from then. Then when I used to leave the Roosevelt Long Island to go back home to Central Islip, I would listen to Rock Kim and Coogee rap. And I would write out Coogee rap and Rock Kim rhymes. And then I would study it. Then that's where I learned the format. But I never thought about getting a record deal or nothing like that. Okay. Until I was like 16, 17. Because my uncle, God bless the dead, born true, was Big Daddy King's bodyguard. Okay. And I was best friends with my cousin, God bless the dead, Driss. So we was in the cafeteria and I was like, yo, it's time to go see Uncle Born about a deal because he used to have us around Big Daddy King all the time. And we used to rap at his house. And he used to take me to all the projects in Brooklyn, battling dudes, battling going, on, rappers on, going on them, yeah. going on them. So that's where I honed my skills at. And then, one day he took me to Big Daddy King's concert in Nassau because I'm from Roosevelt, Long Island also. So mm -hmm. it was Nassau, Big Daddy King's birthday, Nassau Coliseum. We was, at the, we was down the at first time I was ever in the Coliseum and I was by the stage and everything. Went backstage, had to pass. Then he took us to Canarsie, Brooklyn because my other family's from Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And Uncle Bone moved to Canarsie. So he took us to the diner with Kane, and every Kane people was rapping. Then he was like, yo, Keith, it's your go. So I just went over there by Kane, started rapping. Then Kane spit one of his rhymes from his records. And then he was like, how old are you? I was like 16. Then it just started like that. I met uh, Kirk Gazelle from the JVC Force. They had a, strong, a song called Strong Island. They was from my town, Central Islip. I did a demo with him. Then I signed a contract with him, but it didn't really go nowhere. So I went back to school, and then I had to do a little time in jail. Then I came back, I was selling hand-in-hand -hand drugs and going to New York Tech. And then I'm from Central Islip, Long Island, where K-Solo is from. So he used to come to Carton Avenue, where I lived at, off Elmore, Carton Avenue, where LOD always was at. So I just asked him to take me to Eric Sermon house one day because Eric is from Brentwood, a town over from Central Iceland, but his mother moved into the back of Central Iceland. Okay. So then K Solo said, meet him over there. And I was driving, driving my truck over there, seeing him talking to a female. So I made a U-turn and went and got him, and then I followed him to Eric house. Then we went to Eric house and knocked on the door for like 15, 20 minutes, and he came from the <laughs> bottom. Word. Just knocking. Wait and knocking. Then E came up and then Solo said, Yo, this is Keith Murray. I brought him over here to rhyme for you. So we went in E house down in the basement and he was in the music room. That's why he didn't hear us. Mm -hmm. So he started playing beats. Then I was just rhyming from the rhymes I knew and then I just stayed with him. So that's how the start of Death Squad just came well, to play. The Death Squad was 
started because EPMD broke up. Okay. I was with Eric for two years before I ever got on the microphone and did a record. But then EPMD broke up and he moved to Atlanta for a year. <laughs> then he came back. And then Redman was gravitating around him when I used to go see him. Mm -hmm. Then he put us in the studio when it was time for Eric Sermon's solo album. Okay. So we got on the record called Swinging Over Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I did Hostile with the video. And then I started making demos with him. Would you say Hostile was kind of your first, would you say that was your claim to fame then? Your first ever sort of getting yourself out there? Mainstream. Yes, it's the first video I did with E. Sermon, and it was the second song, but it was a single this time, not just on the album. So that was my exposure to the mainstream. And what did that, what did that feel like? Because I can, I can see in your, because you've sort of got all these vivid imaginations of everything. The way you're telling these stories is almost like, this was like the highlight and the excitement that which you got, got you interested. What did it actually feel like going on that record, Hostile? What did, what, did it sort of give you wings? Did it make you say to yourself that this is actually what I want to do? Bear in mind that you said you did a little time in prison, you did some hand-to-hand -hand drugs. So was this almost like the breath of fresh air for you? Well, I was going to school for business administration and the hip hop side swiped me from not going to school no more, to college, because I went to New York Tech, then I went to Suffolk. Mm -hmm. But it was a sense of uh, accomplishment at one point but it, it was a natural progression because when I did do the record mm -hmm. and it was out, Eric used to go on the road all the time, but I never would go. Mm -hmm. I followed the tour bus one time in the Houthi, but that was it. I never would go. He never would take me. Then okay. one day he was like, probably like eight, nine months later, he was like, yo, Murray, I got to start taking you on the road. You know who you are? I didn't really <laughs> feel yeah. it because I, I wasn't there. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But the record was a sense of accomplishment, but I was still hungry because I really wasn't recording. He kept me on ice. Oh, for real? Until he realized, like, yo, I'm gonna start bringing you out. I was like, word, huh? I would like to see that. <laughs> and I went out one day and did a concert, mm -hmm. did the verse mm -hmm. in DC. Yeah. And then just shut it down, broke the barrier, Cop stopped yeah. the show. I was like, yo, that's what I knew. Look, goosebumps. I was like, yo. But are we going to see this on September the 3rd? See, all these li all these songs, are you going to remember all these lyrics on September the 3rd? Oh, yeah, I remember so, every song I ever did. Every I'm single track. to a live band this time. Yeah? Over there. Yeah. So that's what we can expect on September the 3rd, to hear all of these same things, those same goosebumps. In chronological order. Yeah? That the year the songs came out is on my playlist. Okay. So it will unfold like that. You said the live band as well? Yeah. Okay. The live so, band. Okay. Was they New Vibes? Yeah. From new band vibes, from yeah. out here. New Vibes. Okay. Because yeah. a lot of times when rappers do perform, they use a backing track a lot of the times. But you're saying you're going to have a live band and chronological order, you're going to do all of these songs. And where exactly is the actual venue again? Um, the 100 Club. 100 Club. Yeah. And that's September the 3rd. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's in Oxford Street. Saturday. Oxford Street. Saturday. Yeah. Okay. So songs like The Beautiful Thing in the World, we're going to hear all of those classics. That and the Enigma. Okay. And some, some few Death Squad records. Okay. Okay. Because the funny thing is that a lot of times, what, like Candy Bar and those songs as well, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The He's Keith Murray album, definitely. <laughs> okay. No, that's good. That's good. Because I think with, um, when it comes to rap, especially, would you say there's a difference between rap and hip hop? Or would you say they're the same thing? Well, at one point, to me, when I was younger, mm -hmm. rap was the same thing because rap is something you do, hip hop is something you live. Say that again? Rap, rap is, is something you do, hip hop is something you live. Okay, so you say hip hop lifestyle. is more of like a culture then, a rap lifestyle? Rap is a part of hip hop. You got rap, you got graffiti, you got dress, okay. DJing, mm -hmm. B-boys. Freaking B-boys. Okay. Five elements. All right, but then you say hip hop is basically the lifestyle. Exactly. All right. Interesting. Rap is just something you do. Hip hop is something you live. Karis once said that a while ago. Made a lot of sense. Sometimes I think we see rap and hip hop as one, one thing, as it's, yeah. it's homogenous, it's the same thing, but obviously we're not from, the, from America, we're from the UK. And what we don't realize, a lot of the influences that we have in the UK has come from America. 
a lot mm. of the stuff that we do. When we used to rap, when we were younger, we rapped in an American accent. accent. But yeah. Do you know like, what I mean? Somebody yeah. told me that today earlier. Yeah. yeah. Literally, we literally rapped like you guys because um, when it comes to the media, we consumed a lot of stuff from America and there wasn't much in the UK on TV with representation. So, for instance, looking at yourself is what we saw. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. for instance, um, Tupac was a rapper that we all adored. I heard you was at a blues concert and, um, you know, um, he approached you. Can you... Well, um, it was the House of Blues. House of Blues, sorry. Concert. Yeah, and I was a bit upset because, um, you know... Pac was one of my favorite rappers. Mine too. I enjoyed your Still rap as well. And then, you know, a track came out called Who Shot Ya? And, um, you know, it looked like I he was... You. I shot you. So it looked like Big he was... Um, who shot you. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I shot you. It looked like he was kind of... Um, what's the word? They say if you're... Birds of a feather flock together, they say. So if you're amongst something, they assume that you're part of it. So what? just brief us what happened that But I don't think anybody day. was talking about Pac on that record. Sorry? I don't think anybody was talking about Pac or I shot you. Do you feel he, do you feel he had a right to assume that? Yeah, he said he got shot five times. He just wanted to know. And well, what what was it like? Because obviously he was probably even though he was your era, he was probably a fan of his music. I'm assuming. Yeah, he came on before me. Before you. Yeah. I remember selling drugs on the Court Eleven when he was out. Yeah, and then obviously when he, when he approached you about it, was it something you was expecting to happen? At some nah, point? because I was I was in the house of blues and me and Redman and my boy Pop. Red man was on the balance stuff, balance stuff. Mm -hmm. and I was walking around. I seen Pac. I said, "What up, Pop?" He said, "What up, Murray?" Mm -hmm. Shook his hand and walked away. Mm -hmm. So his man in a burgundy suit. It's always the friend, isn't it? Who was the friend? Yeah. Yeah. Yo, you gonna let that yeah, slide, Pac? Yeah. You gonna let that slide, Pac? No, I think it was his bodyguard or somebody mm -hmm. who was, you know, um, rolling with him. Mm -hmm. One of his entourage people that it's like kind of the muscle. Yeah. So he walked up to me and said, "You're my homeboy, and want to know if you talk about him in that record." Mm. I said, "What record? Who's your homeboy?" He mm. said, "Pac." Yeah. So Pac walked up. I said, "I said, Pac, come here. I mm. just saw you said what up to you. You ain't say nothing to me." Mm. So the crowd was looking. They start dispersing. Red man came down from the bounce stuff. Came over where he was at. My boy Pop was there. Then he was like, nah, Mary, I ain't riding on you. I got shot five times. I just want to know. Mm. I said, well, first of all, I don't even like Prodigy. We don't get along. Yeah. Mm. And second of all, I'm not talking about you. I love you, Pop. You know mm. what I'm saying? I had no reason to talk about you. Mm. So his man was like this. So Pop <laughs> put his hand through his man and shook my hand and we yeah. just dispersed. That was it. Okay, because I think... Everyone, not everyone, but looked like everyone made a big deal out about it. Whereas the two people that was involved, you and him, it was nothing. Yeah. But it's almost as if they tried to make it something. It was the the internet person. Mm -hmm. I was talking about it out loud at the Underground's mixtape because mm -hmm. they was acting bougie. I was like, this ain't underground, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I squared off with the best of them. Mm -hmm. But they was filming me from the side. Okay. I didn't really know. Mm. Then they put it clickbait okay. on the people. internet yeah. saying I squared or I had a fight with Pop. Yeah. Just so people would click them. Click and watch. Yeah. Then yeah. they start wanting to hide him because the LOD, we looking for you now. Yeah. You want disrespect? Mm. You want to put force out there? Okay, where you at? Come see me. Yeah. Could never find him. Okay. The bait and switch. Mm. Clickbait. No, oh, no, okay. no. You see clickbait every mm. single day on yep. social media. So that's it's terrible. Yeah. And this is hiding. Because <laughs> even for myself, I assume that's what I... Apart from speaking to you now, I assume that the two of you got into something. Mm -hmm. Until I've now got to the source and it's... It was about this close, but I didn't, wasn't talking about you, Pac. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, was, I guess that's, it's good to sort of clear the air. Yeah. I guess with definitely. the situation. Because I'm assuming maybe it could have been a bit of paranoia. It is parody. He said, I got shot five times. Murray, you know, I shot you from mm. New York. It, you know, he was waging war against East Coast. East Coast. Yeah, that East Coast. Well, you've you been, you been to Cali before, innit? Yeah, I've been to Cali. And yeah. you've been New York. Yeah, I've been New York. But Cali and New York are so far apart. So It's far. How do you beef someone <laughs> that you have to take a six plane, six hour plane journey with? Because he how was, do you he fight was someone always, that he was always in New York and he got shot? Well, he's originally from New York, right? He was born in New York, yeah. but he was always there with Biggie. Yeah. Okay. And he got shot in the elevator in the studio. 
Because I've just so always... studio. Because only as I got older, I realised how far um, New York is to mm, California. And I sit and say, and, and how do two... He took it from New York to Cali. Okay. And stirred it up. Okay. All right. And Biggie was always saying, Biggie was one of my best friends. Like, yo, I never had no problem with Park. I never even got him shot. I was walking by the studio when Biggie and Little C's was standing outside. I was like, what happened? He was like, Pac just got shot in there. Okay. But eventually, Pac knew who did it. He knew Biggie didn't have nothing to do with that, but that's the type of person he was. He created the controversy. He okay. just felt Biggie blew up from him giving Biggie pointers. And Biggie okay. wasn't like, yo, Pac taught me all of this. So what you're technically saying is that that whole East Coast and West Coast beef was manufactured. Definitely. I, we was always in the West Coast. Me, Redman, Eric Sherman all the time. And you had no problems. You could roll on your ones or in your group and no one was G-checking you. Mm -mm. Even though on camera, in the media, it assumed, it assumed that you that, guys yeah. were Like were everyone beefing. in the East is in the East, everyone in the West is in the West. Mm -hmm. God bless the dead. Tupac stirred that up. He was going at Nas. He was dissing De La Soul, everybody. Just because he mm -hmm. felt that he got hit up in the East Coast and it made him look less than who he was. Remember, he was no disrespect to Pac, but mm -hmm. he's from acting. Okay. Yeah. He know how to strike a chord. So where is acting? Because I'm not... We have well, an acting, actor. Like, like, oh, like, oh, like, acting school, like, sorry. Like how okay, everyone says, like, Drake. He came you know, like, Baltimore yeah, yeah. acting with Jada Pinkin. Yeah. Okay, acting school, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he knew how to strike a chord. And how much would you say that East Coast, West Coast beef affected rap in general? So it, obviously you it, came it up... It created the vision, mm -hmm. but... Was it good for rap? In a way? Or uh, not? No, it made so. us look stupid. Yeah. Like, you can't get along. Black like mm. people don't never stick together, and this is personifying it. I remember seeing, uh, but the Mac Ten was taking it serious too at one point. Oh, for real? <laughs> me, and, me and Red Man was just like laughing at this shit. Like, come on, man, that shit ain't. We just don't want to kill each other. Mm. It's unnecessary. Yeah. Especially when you got nothing to do with it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Especially when you're making money as well. Making money. That's the part yeah. I don't get. Your I business. seen Mac Ten in Atlanta. He did the West Coast sign to me. I do this back. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Mm. You see? Word. That's that's. But it, it was real. We got cause Biggie his life. The day before he got killed, he came to the hotel to see me, Red, and E. Mm. Red wasn't there, Eric wasn't there, but I was there and I was sitting right behind him in that truck. Mm. C's was here and D was driving. So we sat there for hours. He was like, yeah. yo, Murray, because I used to go hang out with him in Brooklyn and everything before we both got on. Like we mm. would be around Eric and Puffy. Yeah. So we was getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. He was like, yo, Murray. I got a show in London. What you think? I should stay here or go? I said, big go, because you know they don't like you out here. Yeah. We didn't go to the Soul Train party. Next thing you know, I'm asleep. Eric knocks on my door. Bang, 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 bang. Yo, they just killed your boy. I'm like, who? Biggie. No like, way. What? That's yeah. And yeah. he have no malice in his body. No mm. negativity. 